I'm Alec Baldwin, and you're listening to Marketing Trends and the Leeds Art Week. In 2021, every marketer is trying to crack the code of who their customers are, what makes them tick, and most importantly, what will make them need your product. But what happens when every one of your customers has a different use case for your product? There's no one size fits all approach for that situation. So how do you tailor your message to fit their individual needs? Getting to know customers, I think, is a really critical function for any marketer. And it's something that I encourage across my entire team, regardless of role, you need to get to know the customer. Jeff Baim is the CMO of Formlabs, a professional 3D printing company that is pushing the boundaries when it comes to what can be printed. Formlabs sells to companies across various industries, from dentists to engineers to architects. So finding a message that works for everyone can be a daunting task. On this episode of Marketing Trends, Jeff explains how Formlabs is getting to know its customer base by implementing a data-driven marketing approach. And he gets deep on the importance of personalizing your marketing message to resonate with your customer. Enjoy this episode. This message is brought to you by Salesforce. Hey marketers, today's B2B buyers are more complex than ever, and every buying committee has different needs and goals. Salesforce can help. We'll show you how to put each and every customer at the center of your B2B marketing strategy, and you'll learn how top brands like Lyft approach account-based marketing. Salesforce, market to every account, speak to every buyer. Find free B2B marketing and ABM resources at sfdc.co slash every dash buyer. Welcome to Marketing Trends. I'm Ian Faison, host of Marketing Trends, and today we are joined by special guest, Jeff. How are you? I'm doing well, Ian. How are you doing? Doing great. Excited to have you on the show to talk about Form Labs uh, and and all the uh, cool marketing stuff that you're doing there, and also your background. So let's get into it. How'd you get started in marketing in the first place? Yeah. So I uh, actually have a computer science degree. I graduated with a computer science degree quite a while ago, and immediately figured out that I didn't really want to be doing coding and wanted to be a little bit closer to the customer. So I actually started more in product management, sort of that intersection between product and the customer out listening to customers and getting input into help shape a product direction. At a lot of companies, product management and product marketing tend to overlap and there's obviously a tight combination. So I started doing a mixture of product management and product marketing, more inbound focused product direction, but also started to do more and more in product messaging and sort of outbound focus and found myself working at some tech startups where Product marketing is a pretty critical foundation to overall marketing at those types of companies because you really need to get the messaging and positioning right. And so in many ways, I sort of fell into broader marketing roles given my strong sort of product marketing background. Again, small, especially at smaller companies where out of the gate, product marketing is often the first thing that really needs to get nailed down. So I sort of came in through this through this product to product marketing into general marketing background. Along the way, I got an MBA to help me learn sort of the broader business context, but that's that's sort of how I moved into the marketing area. And so for listeners who don't know, tell us a little bit about Formlabs. So Formlabs is in the 3D printing space. We've been around for close to 10 years now. We entered the market, 3D printing has been around for quite a while. We entered the market basically where 3D printing was separated into either really high-end expensive 3D printers that cost $50,000, $100,000 and up, but were used in heavy industries, aerospace, automotive, et cetera. But again, due to the price point and complexity, they were pretty restricted as to who could really use them. At the other end of the spectrum is a type of 3D printing called fused deposition modeling, which many people are familiar with. It basically takes a spool of plastic and melts it into a shape that you want. And that's really accessible and really easy to use, but often the parts that you get from that are not quite as high quality or high fidelity that you may need to use in more of an industrial or or corporate setting. And so Formlabs came in with the idea of producing very high quality parts at sort of the ease of use and accessibility of those desktop machines. And that's what we've been able to do. We're, as I said, close to a 10 year old company, north of $100 million in revenue. We've sold more than 75,000 printers at this point and, and, and really sort of dominate the market in that desktop 
industrial quality 3D printing area. And so for for our listeners um, who aren't super familiar with kind of like the 3D printing vertical, like where are we at in 3D printing? What where in the what inning are we in? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think we are we are still in early innings, early mid innings of 3D printing. As I said, we've got tens of thousands of printers out there and it's used across a wide variety of industries. The, the biggest use case still for our type of 3D printing is in prototyping. And it's really helping companies across industries more rapidly prototype. So today, if I'm designing just about any product, you will start by creating prototypes to, to, to test the look of something, but even to test the functionality of something before you move it into mass production. And 3D printing dramatically accelerates that, that cycle time, that iteration. And so we have companies, again, from consumer products to aerospace to automotive to just almost every industry you can imagine, they are more rapidly iterating with 3D printing. What we're seeing now, though, also is an increased role of 3D printing in end-use parts and in, in parts that are being used out in, again, in, in, in more broad mass market. Often these are parts that need to be customized. So 3D printing has a real value where you're doing mass customization. Dentistry is a great example of that, where we can actually do end use parts that are used in a patient's mouth. And each part, each tooth, each bridge, each crown, obviously needs to be unique to the patient. But the same can be said for other places where you want that sort of customization that can be used, um, again, in, 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 uh, across a variety, across a wide range of parts. This isn't your first time as a CMO. Uh, why were you so excited to join Formlabs? So when I looked at the opportunity, and I guess for a while now in my career, really there's there's three key things that I look at when I'm looking at an opportunity. And, and the first and biggest for me are the people. And I spent a lot of time with the founding team here, with the leadership team, with the marketing team that I was going to be taking on and managing, and got really excited by the people here, the the intellect, the drive, the passion, the curiosity. Uh, there's just a, it's a great team of people here. The second is the market opportunity. I've worked at a number of companies now where I've had the opportunity to come in and really disrupt a market and change the status quo. And I felt that was really the case here with Formlabs, where, as I mentioned, when I joined the company or when the company really started, we were pretty unique in offering this sort of quality and accessibility combination that nobody else was doing and really changing expectations for 3D printing. And the third was the role and the opportunity to take what was, I think, a really strong marketing team and help move it to the next level, as it were, and help help the marketing team, help the company grow as aggressively as we've been doing for the last three years and as we want to be doing for the next several years. Yeah. And so so you you talked a little bit about the type of customers that you serve. And obviously, there, there are a variety of different kind of use cases and, and, uh, um, and industries and verticals. Um, how do you think about that as a CMO? How do you think about those different personas and those different kind of use cases and, and marketing those? Yeah, it's it can be a challenge. It's 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 a good problem to have, as they say, Ian. It's it's yeah. one of those things that it's a challenge, but I'd I'd rather have that than be struggling to figure out where we can possibly sell this product. But the reality is that, yeah, our product is used by architects and jewelers and dentists and engineers, and each one of them think about 3D printing in a different way. And so one of the core challenges for us is how do we create marketing messaging and materials and strategies that serve such a wide audience? And, you know, where do we go very horizontal and try to come up with messaging that resonates with everybody? And where do we create materials and information that is very specific to an audience? When I was relatively new at Formlabs, one of the great examples that people always told me was when we market to dentists, they love to see bloody teeth. When you market to everybody else, they do not want to see bloody teeth. And so no we, we really hilarious. need to sort of tailor to, to that audience of who we're talking to and using images and language and examples that resonate with them as opposed to, as opposed to just thinking that, oh, we say 3D printing and everybody will know what it means for them. Oh, man, bloody teeth. That is gross. <laughs> but if you're a dentist, that's what you want to see because then you see, ah, they know what I'm dealing with every day. <laughs> That is too funny. What an insight. Are there like chief prototyping officers or is there like a head of prototyping? Is this like a position that, you know, you're trying to create a community around or trying to like get in front of? It seems like, you know, the person um, 
the dentist and the uh, and the person prototyping for for jewelry would be so different. Yeah, no, it really it really does depend on the industry. And in more industrial manufacturing companies, again across automotive or or other engineering sectors, it is more of there's designers or prototypers that work in that space. In dentistry, we're literally selling to dental technicians and dentists, right? They don't have dedicated people who are just doing design there. It, it, in, and in architecture, we're selling directly to architects or in jewelry, we're selling directly to jewelers. And so it really depends on the industry. And that's a big part of what we have to do in marketing is figure out who are the unique personas in each one of these industries. And then again, what is the messaging that's going to resonate with them? Yeah. Do you have any, uh, any favorite campaigns that you've, uh, you've run recently here at Forum Labs? I know bloody, bloody teeth aside, but Hey, if that's working, I mean, that's a great insight. Just uh, a couple of days ago, we had a, an interesting launch in Mark in, in the dental industry. We launched a software feature, which was on the one hand, it was a great launch. And I'll tell you why in a minute. The thing that was unique about it is it's not a feature we're charging for. It's just a new capability that you, you get for free if you happen to use our printer. And it was a feature that we call scan to model, but it basically accelerates the workflow for dentists where they're using intraoral scanners to scan somebody's mouth. And because of the scan to model software, you can go immediately from that intraoral scanner into a model that you can print on our printers without having design skills. Typically before somebody uses our printer, they go into computer-aided design software and create the model in the computer-aided design software. But lo and behold, dentists are not computer-aided designers. That's not a skill that they have. And so we created this feature that was unique to, that is going to be used uniquely in the software space to make it faster for them to move from scanning to printing. And so we created, a, a, again, a campaign and a focus around how are we talking specifically to those dentists who, who want to be able to use 3D printing, but don't want to take the time to learn computer-aided design skills. I think I've had that done to... Uh... In my mouth, I think I've I had that. It was pretty crazy. And they're like, oh, yep, here it is. It just comes in the mail. Exactly. Yeah. Well, in fact, now we're getting to the point where it's chair side. So literally they could have the scanner right there and then they can upload that file and print it. Right now it takes probably about 20 or 30 minutes to print it. And then you do a little bit of washing before you kind of go put it in your mouth. But, you know, it takes, it, it, you know, it's, it's almost immediate. You don't have to wait a week or two for it to have something sent to you in the mail anymore. Wow. Remarkable. That's so rad. So, so do people, you know, you have a function on your site, you have a store, people can buy things directly off of your website, which is different. Do you also have like a, a more B2B style sales go to market? Like how does that work? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, we, we really go to market in three different ways. Uh, we go to market through a, a direct selling force that is the often traditional B2B model of we in marketing are out there running paid advertising or other techniques, going to trade shows, getting leads, feeding those leads off through a traditional funnel with a, with a, a sales force that is going from you know lead to marketing qualified lead to sales qualified lead to pipeline, et cetera, and closing deals of selling printers. We also have a large network of resellers around the world, both in geographies where we don't have a direct presence, but also who are specialized in some sectors where we do have a presence. Um, dental is another good example of that. We work with a lot of resellers in the dentist, dentistry industry um, who have deep knowledge there. Um, and so we, we, we enable and support those resellers to be as successful as our sales force is in selling our printers. And then yes, we have an e-commerce store where people can come and buy printers, but also come back and buy additional resin, right? The 3D printing market is somewhat like the 2D printers in that you buy the printer, but then also you need to, on an ongoing basis, buy the material that is used in the printer, what we call the resin, and so, uh, or what is called the resin, I should say. And we have a whole variety of resins, over 30 different types of resin that solve a variety of use cases. And so people can come to our store and buy liters of resin at, you know, a couple hundred bucks a pop and have that shipped to you. It's so funny, you know, we talk about like this, um, this new CMO the subscription CMO, the person who's worried about not just new logos, but renewals, but about customer journey, about customer life cycle. How do you get to know your customers? What are the different tools and things that you're using to engage with them, to learn about them, you know, gather that info, information, gather data and, and build a relationship? 
Yeah, that's that's a great question, Ian. And certainly getting to know customers, I think, is a really critical function for any marketer. And it's something that I encourage across my entire team, regardless of role, you need to get to know the customer. And there's a variety of ways we do that. At the very outset, we have somebody in our team who or somebody in the uh, broader team who does user research and does a lot of direct first-person research with our customers. And we are encouraged to either join in on those calls or review her research and read and, and learn a lot about it there. We do beta testing with early versions of our product. And again, people are able to be part of those beta tests or talk to customers there. But then there's other more traditional ways where we used to, prior to COVID, do a lot of trade shows and a lot of in-person events. And we always had a number of marketing people at those events, talking to prospects, talking to customers, learning from them. We also have a user forum, where, which is very heavily populated by our customers who are constantly sharing ideas and asking questions. And it's a good place to go hear firsthand what our customers are thinking. And finally, we have user groups, and we have for a number of years now had a user conference where we have hundreds or thousands of, of, of customers coming together. This year was virtual, or last year was virtual, the years before that were in person, but it's a great opportunity to be able to talk to customers and hear firsthand what they're experiencing, what they like about our products, what they wish we could do, but also really importantly for marketing, how they talk about our products. Again, getting back to the idea that we serve very different personas. It's really helpful for me and for everybody in marketing to be able to talk directly to a designer or an engineer and hear, how do you describe our product? How do you think about the benefits of this product and be able to use that language back in our marketing? It is funny. I mean, to just give people the space to, uh, to have those conversations is increasingly difficult in this kind of post-COVID world, right? It's like, you know, we, we talk about a lot on the show of you know, creating the forum for them to have those discussions and then get sales out of the room for a little while. Let them just have those conversations without anyone around. Yeah, no, and, and I, I, I actually, the, the team here, I was incredibly impressed with what our team pulled off a year ago when, again, trade shows, 3D printing is not something that we can offer a free download of, right? It's not a, it's not a freemium model where, you, hey, try it out for a little while and then if you like it, you keep it. Um, we can't do that with 3D printing. And so, we used to rely a lot on in-person events and whether those are trade shows or our own events as an opportunity for people to come see the printer. They want to see the printer before they buy it. And obviously a year ago, that all changed. All of a sudden we weren't going to in-person events. And the team here did an incredible job of pivoting quickly from those in-person events to something that we dubbed Form Labs Comes to You which was a virtual environment that was a mixture of traditional webinars. We tried all sorts of things. We tried Twitch, we tried live streaming, we tried, I mean, we tried all sorts of different things to figure out how we could reach our customers, our prospects most effectively. But most importantly, it kept a constant connection and a constant opportunity for us to keep talking to people and having people see and experience 3D printing, even if it was, even if it was only through their computer screen. So... I mentioned the subscription CMO sort of idea. Mm -hmm. um, do you own a number on like the website sales? Is that something that you share with someone? Is like, how do you, how do you think about website sales? Yeah, in fact, literally just today, we had our standard review of how we're doing on web. And it, I mean, ultimately, it's ultimately what I care most about, to be honest, Ian, is our overall revenue. I care most about overall. Sure. Are we hitting our revenue targets as a company? And that comes through our direct sales force, that comes through our channel sales team and our resellers there, and that comes through e-commerce. There is an, an element of efficiency. And if somebody wants to have a consultative discussion and buy 10 printers and you know 50 liters of resin, it's probably gonna require a sales conversation either through one of our resellers or through a direct salesperson. And so we wanna tee up and enable that conversation to happen. If somebody wants to just come by their next liter of draft resin because they're, they've used out their resin right now, we want to make it as easy as possible to just come in on the web store and, and buy. And so we do track, as an example, what percentage of our what we call consumables, which is basically the resins and other things that you buy once you've got a printer, what percentage of consumables resin are we getting through our web store? And how do we make that as frictionless and, and as easy as possible? So. We do look at that along with the, the basically the, the software development team that is creating our software as well as creating the, the, the software experience on the e-commerce site. Um, and so 
helping to drive that number up as we drive overall revenue up across the company. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd imagine that you're looking at obviously like customer lifetime value and things like that, especially as you're selling something that, um, you know, they're going to continue to buy resin over time. And I'd assume that they're they're probably going to go to you for those sort of things or, or you want them to. Yeah. Um, it's not only that, it's also that in most cases, we land at a customer site where one person buys a printer and a few liters of resin. And what our goal is, is for them to become successful and not only buy more resin, but also to say, hey, let me talk to the other designers at this company, because typically we're landing in companies that have, you know, dozens or more designers and developers who could also be using our product. And so we want to sell more printers into that environment. So, you know, when we started at Gillette uh, or New Balance, as an example, New Balance here, I'm actually wearing a pair of New Balance shoes that are partially 3D printed. Um, with our printer. And, you know, we started there in a prototyping with a couple people using our product to prototype new shoes. And all of a sudden we started to grow there and sell into more groups of New Balance and also sold into a group that was doing new product innovation where they wanted to use 3D printing to actually create parts of the midsole that were end 3D printed on our printers. And so it's starting in one area and not only selling them more resin, but over time selling them more printers and finding more applications for 3D printing at their company. Yeah, your classic land and expand um, experience. Well, you know, what's funny is like buying, buying resin is kind of a trailing metric, right? Yeah. It's like that, it, that implies that they A, had a good experience, that they're using it, that they used the current resin that they had, um, and that they liked it so much that they want to keep going, right? So I, I, it's, it's funny how, you know, that's, it's more of a customer success kind of a problem, right. which is now is kind of synonymous with marketing in a lot of ways. Absolutely. Absolutely agree. Yes. Well, so you mentioned that you don't do a freemium model, but you do have uh, a nice button on the website that says Requ request a free sample part. Um, can you talk about that? Yeah. And that's, that's obviously another big area for us. Again, people, we, we can't just send everybody in the world, one of our printers and say, if you want to keep it, pay for it, otherwise send it back to us. But what we can do is send them examples of what can be printed on our printers. And that is the, that is the free sample model. And so that is a, a key part of the customer buying experience, that's a key part of our marketing funnel, is getting somebody to say, I want to request a, three, a, a sample of what's possible with 3D printers. We enable you to request across a whole range of different materials that we offer. So you can get an elastic-like part to a really rigid part to a medical part to a tooth to whatever, you know, whatever different areas you want. Um, and, then, uh, and then, yeah, we actually... Uh, we have a facility in Ohio. It was actually it's actually the place that produces all of our all of our resin, our, our resin manufacturing facility. They have a whole bank of printers, and uh, they are constantly churning out literally thousands of sample parts a month that we send out. And then it it sparks a great conversation with sales, or uh, our resellers use them as well as part of their uh, process, and and gets people to again be able to see what's possible with a three D printed part. A lot of people have misperceptions about either the surface quality or the rigidity or the uh, ability to do snap fits or other sort of things that require certain tolerances and what's possible with 3D printing. And by sending them the parts, they can really understand those potentials and then, you know, move it down the cycle of saying, yes, I'm ready to buy a printer. Yeah, that's really fascinating. I hadn't thought about that. Well, so I know I, I do know a little bit about 3D printing. And one of the things that I found so fascinating when I was learning about it is that there, there are things that are made in 3D printing that you literally can't make in traditional manufacturing. Like there's certain shapes that like you can't make, like a, what is it, like a honeycomb or something like that? Or Yeah, there's a variety of geometries that are either extremely difficult or almost impossible to make using traditional manufacturing techniques that because of the nature of 3D printing, you're, you're able to make certain geometries. The other thing is you can, make, you can make parts with a lot less material because it's a lot easier to make hollow structures yeah. or structures where you're, you're focused on sort of the structural integrity, but you don't need them to be solid filled. And, and so there's a variety of ways to make parts that are, again, that are, that are better than, than traditional manufactured counterparts. So, and like a great example probably is like your new balances, the, the component part that's in that new balance that has a structure, like a lattice or something, or I don't yeah. know. Yeah, yeah, no, it is. Yeah. So like a lattice, look at, 
I'm going deep into the uh, into the mind to, to go back to my 3D printing stuff. Um, technically, I was a systems engineering minor, so I think somewhere in my deep recesses, I actually have done this uh, a decade ago. And again, in some ways, this is the this is another sort of both opportunity and challenge for us in marketing 3D printing is it's something that at the surface level, everybody sort of kind of gets the idea of and may have some exposure to the idea of having something that turns a, you know, creates a shape out of either a liquid or a spool of thread. I kind of get what that does and I kind of understand, but I don't necessarily know how does that apply to my work? How does that, how does that help me? And so that again is a big part of what we need to do in marketing is translate this conceptual technology that I kind of understand into, no, I actually need this because this can either help me improve patient outcomes or it can help me get to market faster with my products or it can make my factory floor more efficient. This is how 3D printing actually impacts me. And that's a, a key part of what that sort of translation that we need to do in marketing. Yeah. And so I, I'm curious, like how much time do you spend like with net new people to 3D printing versus like, hey, you should use us because we're the best. A lot of the market is still net new, Ian. It's, I mean, crazy. I think yeah. it has been around for a while, but it has been either constrained to really high end use cases where the audience is pretty small, or it's been subjugated to being sort of a desktop toy. And so the idea of it being a mainstream product that Again, designers and engineers across any company should be using in their day in, day out work stream. Again, people are familiar with this technology. They may have used, again, like an FDM printer in college, but using this type of 3D printing technology, often we are, we are the first time they're doing this often. And, and, and so it is net new more often than it is, hey, I've been using one type of 3D printer. I'm going to switch to a different one. There are competitors, there are other 3D printing manufacturers out there, but more often than not, we're competing against status quo and not using 3D printing. Fascinating. Yeah, that's that's super that's super interesting. You're also competing with prehistoric animals because there's a velociraptor on your website that was 3D printed and I want to know the story. <laughs> yeah, no, we do have we do have a lot of fun. I mean, we, you know, in addition to sort of the more target primary segments in more industrial, we have a lot of uh, actually a lot of ho- a lot of movies. Um, the Oscars just came out, and there's a lot of movies that use our use our uh, a lot of studios that use our products to create the props. Um, one of the most famous when I first got here that we were enjoying talking about was the Demogorgon from Stranger Things, and that you know that that creature that came up out of the wall or whatever that was that was modeled using our technology using using our printers, and we've got a great story about you know, about how they did that and how they came up with that. And, 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 and so we, we end up creating a lot of fun objects here in the office. Uh, if I were to take you on a, on a walk around the office, you would see a lot of fun things that people print here in their spare time. That is so rad. I, uh, we need a, we need a miniature Demogorgon for, <laughs> uh, for Hillary, our, our amazing producer, uh, and some new balances for Aaron. Uh, the, the Slack DMs are, are blowing up. Uh, that's rad. I mean, so I, I'm always curious when you have things like that, that are so cool, that are so interesting, that are so topical, how do you work that in versus, you know, Gillette, which is Gillette is awesome and, and also cool, but it's just, you know, it's not quite as, as, uh, as, as cutting edge as the, the, I guess it is pretty cutting edge, pardon the pun. Um, but uh, it's not quite as uh, in your face as the Demogorgon. Oh, it's definitely in your face as well. Um, no, I think... Uh, <laughs> Touche. <laughs> um, to be honest, I intentionally try to focus more on what, mul- what may seem a little bit more dull, but frankly, what is more practical and more scalable because our primary use case is not people printing Demogorgons or, you know, other, you know, or, or baby Yodas or other sort of fun parts. Our, our primary use case is people tackling the mundane but really important parts of streamlining manufacturing workflows. And whether that's producing razors or whether that's producing, you know, parts that you'll never see that are on a car or other, other sort of mundane things, that's where the real That's where the biggest opportunity, I think, is because 3D printing fundamentally transforms how every product is made. And, you know, it's there's sexy, fun things, but then there's also just the the majority of stuff that's being made out there. 
that we can accelerate either the product development or even create those end use parts with. So you have a partnership that you've, you've launched recently um, around customized headphones. Uh, this is something yeah. near and dear to my heart as an audio person who's truly never found a pair of headphones that actually fit. Uh, and uh, I think I have weird shaped ears or something. So yeah, can you talk, because this is like one of those use cases where it is the, the, I mean, we talk about personalization all the time from a marketing perspective, but from a product perspective, companies that can nail personalization. We've seen it with shoes and how well shoe companies have done that. This type of thing seems like is such a powerful business case uh, for, for a company. Absolutely. No, this is, this is a great example of mass customization because everybody has earphones, earbuds, ear pods, uh, and everybody's ears are different. Your ears may be particularly unique. I don't know. I haven't looked at them, but uh, everybody's ears are, are slightly different and ear canals are different. And we've all, or at least I have, and I think many people have had the experience of trying in one of those, you know, in-ear ear, uh, AirPods um, and, or variations of those. And as soon as you move, they fall out. Um, my AirPods are great, but I cannot run with them. I'm one of those people that- Yeah, me neither. Take two steps with my AirPods, they fall out. But that's what this partnership with Sennheiser is all about. So Sennheiser obviously is a premium audio brand and we're partnering with them where you can uh, use an app on your iPhone to literally just take a scan of your ear and then it will, then they will create a custom pair of earbuds in ear earphone, uh, earphones that are, that are specific for your ear canals. In fact, different for the right and left based on the specific geometries of your ear. And so, yeah, that is a, that is a great example where um, it's a mass produced part because we're gonna, you know, everybody wants one, but it's customized for each and every person. And so that's that's a that's a great use case for three D printing. Trying to do that with traditional manufacturing techniques, you couldn't do it because you would have to set up and create the machining and tooling for each part individually, and the, the scale there does not work. That is so rad. I love it. Switching gears, uh, you have been a CMO a few times. What is it like this go around? What, what have you done different? What have I done differently this go around? I mean, I think, I think the role of CMO has continued to evolve over the years. I think that everything in marketing has become much more data-driven. We can measure things a lot more effectively than we used to. We can also, one of the things I really encourage my team to be doing because in part because of data is to do a lot more experimentation and to try new things and test it out and then fail quickly. I mentioned earlier that the pivot that the team had done so successfully a year ago in moving to virtual events. And as I said, we tried a lot of different things. Twitch was not successful for us, but I'm glad we tried it, right? It was, it was a platform to try. We were able to measure really quickly how that compared to Facebook Live or other platforms we tried and figure out that that wasn't necessarily a good one. But I'd rather have the team trying new things and learning and then iterating off of that. So I think that's one. One of the differences I see culturally here at Formlabs compared to other companies is because of the allure of 3D printing, we draw from a much wider audience than I've seen in traditional tech companies, where I've worked in Boston Tech for a long time now, and you tend to see the same people cycling through all sorts of different B2B tech companies. Here at Formlabs, we get a, a much wider range of people who have a more artistic or maker background who are genuinely interested in the impact of 3D printing. And I think that gives a new perspective into what we do in marketing and it brings fresh voices and fresh ideas. And so I'm constantly, again, trying to bring people in who can bring in those new ideas and new voices, allow them to experiment and then use data to measure what's working and what's not working and double down in the areas that are and learn from the areas that aren't. Yeah, the data piece and the, the tools piece and experiments, I mean, it's something that we talk about almost every single episode, but it's so critical. And it's, um, it's something that I think certain CMOs really struggle with, especially when they're on the creative side, when they're used to, maybe they came from an agency background, when they're used to running those agency type campaigns and and uh, maybe they don't have the connections to, to hire, you know, the bench to hire from, to hire the, the data team that, that really gets you to prove and to run experiments that those campaigns are working. How did you look at bringing talent, uh, like data-driven talent onto your team? Yeah, when I joined, the, we already had a couple people doing sort of marketing operations, marketing analytics. We've doubled down on that team over the past couple of years. 
and really have a strong bench that is able to help us understand the success of our marketing campaigns or the effectiveness of our marketing campaigns much more than we than we used to. That's an area where, as I mentioned earlier, we've hired creative people into a lot of different roles or people with maker or artist backgrounds. This is definitely an area where I want somebody who's got some data background and understands how to understand how to look at and 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 how to present data in a way that's that that we can use to make decisions off of. So it it is definitely a critical area. As as you said, you've talked about it on a lot of your episodes. It's it's I, I fully agree with the importance of this and and yeah, I've been around in marketing long enough to remember when marketing was much more of an art. Uh, and while art is still absolutely important, it's blending the art and the science that is so critical today. We need to have a creative flair and that gets back to trying new things, but then we need to be able to measure that and figure out where do we invest more. Outside of amazingly cool things like 3D printing Thor's hammer and, and all the other cool stuff that, that you all have been up to, What's next uh, for Formlabs? What's, uh, what's on the horizon for you? Any marketing trends that uh, you find particularly uh, interesting going forward? Yeah, so I think at, at a high level, what's next for us is we are growing like crazy, which is really exciting. Last year was a growth year for us, despite the COVID pandemic. And you know, a lot of companies really struggled last year, both because of the role of 3D printing in helping with the COVID crisis itself, and also just in the ability to use 3D printing in a distributed way. We ended up having a very strong growth year last year and have had a really strong start to this year and, and have very high aspirations for our growth goals. And that, that in and of itself is a challenge as a marketing leader, but also as a marketing team is just simply keeping up with that scaling. The other thing obviously on the horizon is what does it mean to return to in-person events? We've done so much with virtual events over the past year that have been so successful. There's no way we're just going to walk away from the virtual event platforms, but yet we definitely want to get back to in-person events and letting people see and touch the printers in person. And so how do we, how do we blend those? How do we look at a hybrid structure of both taking the best of what we've done on the virtual side while returning to in-person? So that, that, that's definitely going to be something for us to watch. Um, and then, and then, yeah, just how do we, how do we continue to go deeper into different industries and talk directly to the, the personas and the customer voices that we need to in each of those different segments? Yeah, the, the, the in-person blended, I mean, I think that that is like maybe the number one thing on, on CMO priorities is how do you do hybrid events? Because we know for a fact that events work and they drive a ton of business and pipeline and they make your salespeople happy. You know, like there's a, there's an adage about um about I don't know if you're a football fan, but getting your offensive line, uh, you, you can't always call pass plays because then your offensive line is never moving forward; they're always moving backwards. And you want to give you want to give the uh, the the big folks up front. You want to get them moving forward. And I kind of feel that way for events. Is like salespeople want to be out there. They want to be talking to people. They want to be schmoozing and doing those things. So it is important to do that. But the hybrid event thing, it's like if you can create a really good hybrid event and especially highly targeted hybrid events uh, or digital events um, that are engaging and you're doing those well and kind of we've been working on this thing, it's like it's just so much more scalable um, and easier to produce and create. Yeah, absolutely. And what I, what I can imagine, and we don't have this playbook fully fleshed out yet, and I'm expecting the team will experiment again with a lot of different approaches and figure out what works. But I can imagine us returning to a world where we're going to those in-person trade shows, again, not just to get our offensive line out there moving forward, but also, as I mentioned earlier, because people want to see printers in person. That's just a even you know different from software in this hardware world. People want to see and touch the hardware in person. But in addition to that, I think we will complement and have more sort of surrounding that in-person event with virtual activities that are both pre and post for people going to the event but also finding ways for people who aren't able to travel to that event, experience aspects of the event remotely. One of the biggest successes for me last year of, among many in the marketing team was our user summit, where in years past, we had done in-person user summits. The last one had been in Boston in 2019. We had about a thousand people show up, which was fantastic. We had a really successful event. We hosted a virtual user summit last fall. We did 36 hours of straight programming because it was a global event. So we literally had stuff going on around the clock to meet audiences 
in Asia and in Europe. And we had 5,000 people sign up. And it was just a, such at a bigger scale and really engaging content. And so how do we, you know, there's big events that happen in our industry in the US and in Europe and in Asia, and how do we bring audiences on a global basis to those events if they can't physically travel there, either for health concerns or just because it's too darn expensive or takes too much time to fly across the world for these events. And so that's the sort of thing I think we're gonna be looking at and how do we, yeah, how do we blend that, that, that in-person and virtual experience together? Let's get into our lightning round questions. These questions are fast and easy. Just like marketing with Salesforce, you can go to salesforce.com slash marketing to learn more about marketing on the world's number one CRM, that is Salesforce. Salesforce.com slash marketing for all of our listeners who have heard us talk about Salesforce marketing for so long, for years at this point on marketing trends. Go check them out, salesforce.com slash marketing. Lightning round questions, Jeff, are you ready? I think so. Number one, what is the favorite thing that you or someone near you has 3D printed recently? Well, the favorite thing right now is the shoes that I'm wearing, the New Balance shoes that I'm wearing that are partially 3D printed. Do you have a favorite book or podcast or, or, or show that you've been binging recently? Well, the a book that I just read that I really love, it's completely off topic, is one called A Paragon. And it's about the sort of Israeli-Palestine situation and comes at it from a whole number of different directions as the title A Paragon it would suggest. So it's, it's a fascinating read. And my sister turned me on to it and I absolutely love it. If you weren't in marketing, what do you think you'd be doing? Teaching. What is your best advice for a first time CMO? Listen and learn from the people working from you. Don't pretend that you have all the answers. Make sure that you engage and, and, and have a team that is actually doing better than you and that, that you know, a rising tide lifts all ships. And it's about how you, can, how you can enable your team to succeed, which will in turn help you be successful. What question do you never get asked that you wish you were asked more often? By whom? By you? By anybody in the by world? By anybody. By anybody. <laughs> um, I like the question about what, what do I, what would I do if I wasn't uh, a marketer? I think that's, that's a good question for people because, and I actually like asking questions like that during interviews because I think it sort of pulls out what are the soft skills or what are the latent sort of passions that people have? So I think that's a really good question to sort of understand what makes people tick. 2020, our, our skills got softer and maybe our bodies did too, but, uh, <laughs> um, but uh, it, it is a great question to ask. Well, that's it. That's all we got for today. Um, for everybody, uh, go check out Form Labs. Uh, a lot of cool stuff on there and a sweet website, might I add. I'm a fan. Uh, great design. Um, Jeff, any final thoughts? Anything to plug? No, I, I appreciate the, the plug to our website. We are also hiring. We've got a number of marketing positions open right now. We're constantly looking to grow the team. We've got, and in addition to the ones that are listed, we often add people who just come in and are really passionate about what we're doing here. And we can figure out a way to make people fit here because we are growing and it's an exciting time for us in this industry overall. Wonderful. Jeff, thanks so much. Take care. Thank you, Ian. Marketing Trends Podcast is brought to you by Salesforce. Discover marketing built on the world's number one CRM, Salesforce. Put your customer at the center of every interaction. Automate engagement with each customer and build your marketing strategy around the entire customer journey. Salesforce, we bring marketing and engagement together. Learn more at salesforce.com slash marketing.